Good evening and welcome. This is the day that the Lord has made. We rejoice and we are glad in it. Thanks be unto God for his indescribable gift of grace that he has shown towards each and every one of us in the gifting of his son, Jesus Christ. And it is through Jesus Christ that we have life and that more abundantly. I don't know what I know about anybody else who's looking or listening or who's tuning in this night, but I am grateful for the blessing and for the privilege of life. But I'm also excited about abundant life. I'm excited about all of the bountiful blessings and the wonderful things that the Lord allows us to experience on a spiritual level and even on a human level through his son, Jesus Christ. If you are excited about that, I would that you would take a moment to give God praise just for all that he has done for us this day. He is great and greatly to be praised. We're excited about another opportunity that we have on this worship on Wednesdays to study the word of God together, to open up the scriptures, to behold wondrous things from the word of God that will help us grow in our faith and strengthen our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. I greet you, our wonderful members. I greet you, our virtual visitors and friends. Thank you for tuning in. Do me a favor. Before we move forward together, I want you to like this, uh, this video. I want you to comment on it. Let us know that you're here. And then I want you to share it. Share it with others so that they can be tuned into the word, so they can study with us tonight as we shall be fed in and through the word of God. I want to open us up in a word of prayer. And I'm excited to conclude chapter one of our series, Faith That Works. Uh, as we journey through the book of James tonight, we're going to look at these last two verses uh, in James chapter 1. So we won't be long tonight, but we still want to ask God's blessings on our time. And we just want to thank God for the privilege of being able to study his word. Let's do that together. Father, we love you and we thank you once more and again. We bless your holy name for your favor that has continued to be evident in our lives. We thank you for another opportunity to gather together, even in this social space, to open up the scriptures, to behold wondrous things from your word, so that we may be enlightened, so that we may be encouraged, so that we may be strengthened, so that we may be fortified and fed your will for our lives, that we may be directed towards your purpose, that we may once again be made stronger in the discerning of your voice. Thank you for this opportunity and for this privilege. We ask now that you would help us to identify and to remove any distractions or any deterrents that might hinder us from focusing singularly on the study of your word at this time. We want to give you the glory of our, give you the glory rather through the giving of our time, through the commitment of our time, the stewardship of our time and even of our minds and spirits. We thank you for this opportunity to share. And we ask that you would sanctify these moments together. In Jesus' name, amen. And praise the Lord. All right, I want you to open your Bibles or open your Bible apps once more and again to the Epistle of James. And even in this series of journeying through James, studying and learning about possessing and having a faith that works. We've kind of been in a bit of a mini-series uh, for the past several weeks of this month, and we have been looking at verses 19 through 27 of James chapter 1, which is where we'll be again tonight, and we've been talking about uh, the key to spiritual flourishing, the keys to spiritual flourishing, and the purpose or the aim of this particular mini-series within this series, if you will, is to show us those things that we need, reveal to us those keys and those principles that we need that will help us to truly grow spiritually, help us to really bear some spiritual fruit, help us to really see some spiritual progress uh, where we move from faith to faith and from glory to glory to really align ourselves spiritually so that we can be in tuned into God's will for our lives 
and we can also be able to better discern God's purpose for our lives. And so James chapter 1, verses 19 through 27 has revealed to us uh, three keys, and we'll deal with a third of those keys tonight. But if you remember from past lessons, the first of those keys that James shows us that we need to spiritually grow and to spiritually flourish is that we need to respond attentively to the word. Uh, and then the second of those keys, which we learned on last Wednesday, was responding actively to the word. And the last key, the last key that we're going to look at tonight is responding appropriately to the word. Go ahead and type that in the chat or in the comment section. In order for me to, to flourish spiritually, in order for me to experience some real growth and development in the area of my spiritual life, to mature, to be brought to a place of maturity and wholeness and completeness, it means that I must respond appropriately to the word of God. Let's read the scriptures together. James chapter 1 verses 19 through 27 again, and our main focus tonight is going to be on those final two verses, verses 26 through 27. But let's read it all together again for context from the New Revised Standard Version. James says this, You must understand this, my beloved, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to anger, for your anger does not produce God's righteousness. Therefore, rid yourselves of all sordidness and rank growth of wickedness and welcome with meekness the implanted word that has the power to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not merely hearers who deceive themselves. For if any are like hearers of the word and not doers, they are like those who look at themselves in a mirror. For they look at themselves and on going away, immediately forget what they were like. But those who look into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and persevere, being not hearers who forget, but doers who act, they will be blessed in their doing. Verse 26, if any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues, but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Verses 26 and 27 is where we want to focus tonight because it gives us the spiritual key to help us spiritually flourish, and that is responding appropriately to the Word of God. Let's revisit and recite once more and again our faith principle and our life application principle for this passage. What is the faith principle? Remember, the faith principle is what? What it is that we should know, what it is that we should learn as a consequence of studying this passage. You should know it by heart now if you've been with us for the past two weeks, but let's revisit it again. Our faith principle is this. The believer in Christ increases in spiritual wisdom through their obedience to the word of God. The believer in Christ increases in spiritual wisdom through their obedience to the word of God. That is what we have been called to know. The more we obey what the word of God says, the more we adhere to the teachings of Christ, the more we apply the principles of scripture to our lives, the more we increase in spiritual wisdom. That we become more spiritually wise. That is, when the Holy Spirit acts upon our minds and our hearts to do those things that honor God and please Jesus Christ. And when we do those things that honor God and please Jesus Christ, it results in spiritual growth. 
it results in spiritual maturity. So, what have we been called to do? That's what we've been called to know. What have we been called to do? Let's revisit our life application principle. Our life application principle is this. We should apply the wisdom of the word to our lives so that we can avoid deceptive and destructive spirituality. Apply the word, which is what we really talked about in great detail last week. If you were not present, you want to go to YouTube or our Facebook page to revisit those lessons, to revisit that lesson in particular, because it definitely ties into what we talk about tonight. We should apply actively the word of God to our lives, the wisdom of the word to our lives, so that we can avoid deceptive and destructive spirituality. Deceptive meaning, as we talked about last week, that we're really walking outside of logic, <laughs> that we have really miscalculated, not counted up the cost of what it truly means to be a follower of Christ, to live a life committed to kingdom discipleship. And when we have that type of deceptive spirituality, it doesn't just deceive others, but we also deceive ourselves. And it doesn't just destroy us, but it also becomes destructive to others. It erodes and eats away at our Christian witness and our Christian effectiveness in being partners with God in the reconciliation of all of humanity to Jesus Christ. So we must avoid that type of spirituality. You shouldn't want to be a destructive Christian. You shouldn't want to be a deceptive Christian. God knows we have enough of those, particularly in these United States of America. A lot of what we have seen in our nation, but not just in politics, but even on the periphery of the politics, there have been a lot of discussions even in Christian circles, a lot of debates and a lot of infighting. Because there have been individuals who just possess destructive and de deceptive spirituality. Right? Some of you witnessed and saw that viral video that was going around a couple of weeks ago of that pastor praying that people would experience harm. That people would experience negativity in their lives. That people would experience pain in their lives that they would have a bad year, all because their particular political candidate did not win. If that's not deceptive or destructive spirituality, I don't know what is. When have you ever heard Christ say that we should pray for the destruction of other people? That they would experience all of the unpleasantries of life. That's not Christian, but when the wisdom of the word has not been applied to your life. When you are a hearer and not just a doer, or if you don't understand the scriptures correctly, it leads to deceptive and destructive spirituality. I could go on in that, but, but let me be a good steward of my time tonight. Let's, let's, let's hop in to, to see this, how, how this final key of appropriately responding to the word of God, how that can be lived out in our everyday existence. Let's, let's look at verses 26 and 27 again. I hope you kept your Bible app and your Bible open. What is James doing here? In, in these final verses, James extends his teaching on what it means to be a doer of the word and how applying the word to your life leads to spiritual flourishing. That's what he's getting to in verses 26 and 27. And in verse 26, let's, let's take it verse by verse. In verse 26, James begins by painting a portrait of the believer who is not responsible with their actions, particularly their behavior through words. James deals with that in, in, in verse 26. Look at what he says again. If any think they are religious and do not bridle their tongues but deceive their hearts, their religion is worthless. Hmm. 
That person, according to James, that, that, that person, and I'm on your handouts here, that person who is not responsible with their words, not responsible in their behavior through their words or their actions through their words, that person is in possession, according to James, of a religion that is lifeless. Right? Your religion has no life in it. In fact, the word he uses, he says, their religion is worthless. What is James getting to here? A couple of things. And I need you to hear me because this applies to all of us. Get this. A person's conversation is an indication of their Christianity. A person's conversation is an indication of their Christianity. The words that you use, what comes out of your mouth, the things that pass through your mind and eventually they are processed verbally through your lips is an indication of your Christianity. Now I know I got some smart believers out there and y'all saying, well, good thing I don't say everything that I think. Don't be fooled by that. What kind of words are you typing? <laughs> what kind of words are you sending in your text messages and your emails? What kind of words are you exchanging through group chats? Right? <laughs> Those words as well are an indication. What, what are you typing on Twitter? What are you typing on Facebook? Those words as well are an indication of your Christianity. Right? Now, again, let me preface this for, you know, the individuals who, who think that I'm trying to be legalistic or I'm trying to be overly judgmental. Listen, all of us have lapses mentally where sometimes flesh overtakes spirit and we don't always think before we talk. We don't always think before we type. Right? So thank God for grace. <laughs> thank God for forgiveness in Christ that we have an opportunity to. You know, sometimes go back and delete, maybe, if it hadn't been screenshotted and passed around. But at least we have an opportunity to grow and learn and sometimes atone for the things that have come out of our mouths and for the things that we have put out there. So I'm not being overly legalistic or judgmental here, but I am trying to focus us to be more intentional about the usage of our words, our speech. Your conversation is an indication of your Christianity. Your words are, an, are external expressions of the internal position of your heart. If you want to know what your heart looks like, if you want to know where your heart is positioned, pay attention to what's coming out of your mouth. Or if you want to know where somebody else's heart is, what is the position of their heart, which in many cases is an indication how their mind works, how their mind thinks, judge what comes out of their mouths, right? And that's why, I, I don't mean to get sidetracked here and chase rabbits, but that's why, you know, with, with some individuals under this last presidential administration, I had a difficult time reconciling how some people could say, well, I don't pay attention to what the president says. All I pay attention to is what his policies are. I got a problem with that because your heart in a real sense influences your policies and if what is in your heart eventually comes out of your mouth eventually it's going to have impact in places in other people's lives so if racist things are in your mouth if xenophobic things are in your mouth or in it or in your mouth that means they started in your heart and eventually, guess where they're going to come out? In your policies. That's going to impact and affect other people's lives in a negative way. Right? So it's, it's not just paying attention to necessarily what people do. It's also paying attention to what they say. It's a reflection of your heart. This is why James would say in verse 19, remember when we started this? James would say, that every believer should be real slow to speak. Be slow to speak. And when James says be slow to speak, that phrase 
is wise counsel to every believer to give prayerful consideration and intentionality to your words. Be slow to speak. Take time to process your thoughts. You know, I know sometimes, you know, the words, it just kind of, they just kind of come up and sneak out. <laughs> but James says, if you're a believer, you ought to be slow to speak. Because what you say carries a lot of weight, carries a lot of impact spiritually. Every believer should be so slow to speak. Most people would not believe it, but outside of the pulpit, I'm a relatively quiet person. I'm a relatively introverted person. And some of you may be like that. And that's because I do my best. I'm not perfect at it. And I'm not trying to set myself up as the example here. But no, I, 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 what, I'm, what, I'm, what I mean to, to exemplify here is that I do my best. And I still got a long way to go. But I do my best to try to be intentional about processing what I say. Processing how I respond because of the God that I represent. Because of the church that I represent because of the Christ that I represent. And I know that my words carry weight. And it ain't just the pastor's words that carry weight. Your words carry weight as well. Give consideration, prayerful consideration, and intentionality to your words. Failing to do so results in deceptive and destructive spirituality. Hear it again. James says, if anyone seems to be religious... And religious here means leading a life of God-honoring worship. If anyone seems to be leading a life of God-honoring worship, right, a lifestyle of worship. Now, when we talk about worship, we're not just talking about what you do on Sunday, you know, singing, lifting up the hands, all of those external expressions of worship. No, you have been called as a believer to live a life of worship. Everything that you do is worship, right? So if, if anyone seems, James says, to be leading a life of God honoring worship, to be religious, but not bridle their tongues. What does it mean to bridle your tongue? You don't restrain or control your tongue, but you deceive their hearts. Your religion is worthless. Where did James get this from? He got it from his brother. He got it from his brother Jesus. Look at what Jesus says in the Gospel of Matthew and Mark about being careful about your words and ultimately what your words reveal, right? Matthew chapter 12, verses 33 through 37, the New Revised Standard Version says this. Look, hear the words of Jesus. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the what? Heart, the what? The mouth speaks. The good person brings good things out of a good treasure, and the evil person brings evil things out of an evil treasure. I tell you on the day of judgment, you will have to give an account for every careless word you utter. For by your words, you will be justified. And by your words, you will be condemned. Jesus says, listen, stop with this duplicitous, deceptive spirituality. If you're going to be a good tree, bear some good fruit in the form of your speech. If you're going to be a bad tree, then just go ahead and, and, and be bad with it. Go ahead and be evil with it. But don't go back and forth because what you do is deceive people with that. But it's also a revelation of your heart. And more than that, Jesus says, when it all comes down to it, you're going to be judged by the words that have come out of your mouth and your words will either justify you or your words will contribute to your condemnation. What else does he say? Mark 7. Look at Mark 7, verses 17 through 23. If this is making sense, give me a thumbs up out there. Mark 7, verses 17 through 23. 
when he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples asked him about the parable. He said to them, Then do you also fail to understand? Do you not see that whatever goes into a person from outside cannot defile, since it enters not the heart but the stomach and goes into the sewer? Thus he declared all foods clean. Verse 20, and he said, It is what comes out of a person that defiles, for it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come, fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. Therefore, Jesus says, we have to guard, Jesus says through James, or James building on the teachings of Jesus, says that we have to guard our speech. We'll get into this more in chapter two, when he, or chapter three rather, when he talks about taming the tongue. But foundationally, you need to understand here that what we say glorifies God. And part of the contribution to your spiritual growth and to your spiritual flourishing is revealed in how you speak appropriately. Moving through the handout. When you do not honor God through your conversation, the greatest harm done is to your spiritual health. Mm. When you do not honor God in your conversation, the greatest harm done is to your spiritual health. Think about it, you know, when you, when you gossip about somebody, when you spill the tea on somebody, right? When you get that good feeling from telling that person where to go and how to get there, or sending that message or clapping back in that email, and ooh, you, 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 you think you didn't, you didn't got them. And yeah, <laughs> it may give you some instant gratification. But guess who ultimately has been damaged by that? You. It has harmed your, it has set you back spiritually. Your life, and, and I, this is not pastor saying this. This is the word of God saying this. Hear what James says again. If you do not bridle your tongue, but deceive in your heart, your religion is worthless. What is he saying there? Your life becomes of useless value to the kingdom purpose of Christ when you do not guard your speech. You have taken yourself out of position, at least temporarily, and for some of us, you know, because there have been some people who have been so careless with their words that they have been they, they have taken themselves out of position permanently for, from being used by Christ to impact the lives of other people because they did not consider the weight of their words. Didn't consider the weight of their words. How many people, and God, God is just dropping stuff on me. The Holy Spirit is, is just dropping things on me. How, how many people, think about it, and it's still happening, but how many people during that last administration lost jobs, lost income, did damage to their future, got kicked out of school, lost opportunities because they did not consider the weight of their words, posted race, racist or negative things on social media or sent them to, to other people cost them, right? And I know that's on a real low level, but think about that on a high spiritual level. God says, you, you become more useless to me if you do not consider your words. Colossians 3 and 17, it, it won't be on the screen, but you need to hear what it says. Well, Paul admonishes those of us who are believers that whatever we do in word or in deed, we do so 
to the glory of Jesus Christ. We do so to the glory of God. You got to keep that in mind. How many times, and I'm, I'm asking this question in transition, I'm moving to the last verse. How many times, you ain't got to answer on social media, just reflect on it. How many times have you allowed your words to cancel out your worship? How many times have you allowed your words to cancel out your worship? Remember now, I'm not talking about worship, lifting up the hand, singing of the song. I'm not talking about that Sunday morning stuff you do. I'm talking about the life of worship that you have been called to lead. The life of worship that honors God even in your interaction with other people. How many times have your words done damage to that? Bringing glory to the name of Jesus Christ. Right. Finally, James says, responding to the word appropriately encompasses not just our conversation, that's what verse 26 was talking about, but responding appropriately to the word also deals with our compassion and our conduct. Our compassion and our conduct. Look at verse 27. James says, Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. Now when James speaks about pure religion, when he speaks about true religion here, being expressed through the care and compassion of widows and orphans, what is, what is he talking about here? He is speaking about us giving intentional energy and attention to God's special interest, right? I need you to get that. Give, giving intentional energy and attention to God's special interest. In other words, pure religion, true religion, James is teaching, is caring about what God cares about. It's caring about what God cares about, but it's also caring about who God cares about. James says that's pure religion. Giving energy and attention to God's special interests. Who, who were the widows and, and orphans? And why does James feel the need to lift this up? Well, you got to remember now, this is, in fact, the whole of Scripture, for the most part, is written in a very patriarchal society. It's a very male-dominated society. If you were not a male, if you were not a man, you were considered pretty much not a second-class citizen, you were considered a lower-class citizen, right? So it's a very male-dominated patriarchal society, and orphans and widows, other words, kids without fathers, wives without husbands that maybe had passed, or, you know, through divorce, widows and orphans were often people who were neglected and dispossessed in every aspect of society. They were not looked after financially. They were not looked after legally. In fact, they were often take advantage, taken advantage of. They were not looked after spiritually. And so, when, when we take this into consideration, this is why when you look at the whole of Scripture, from the New Testament to the Old Testament, when you look at the whole of Scripture, God repeatedly, God repeatedly commanded his people to not neglect widows and orphans. He commanded his people to care for them and for his leaders to defend them so that they were not forgotten or taken advantage of. God was always clear on this. If you are in relationship with me, one of your responsibilities is not just fidelity and faithfulness to me and to my word, but it's also looking after those who are marginalized in the culture, marginalized in the society. What does that mean? If you don't hear nothing else I say tonight, get this. God is a God of of social justice. Somebody help me type by, by typing that. Help me by, by putting that out there. 
God is the God, is a God of social justice. May get a status and tag me in it because I, I, I want the world to know that, that I stand by this and this is evident in scripture. God is a God of social justice. Aside from idolatry, let, let me help you tonight. For those of you who may disagree, read your Bible. Aside from idolatry, aside from the worship of false gods, it was Israel's lack of social justice that angered God. Whenever you see God mad at his people, he would always start by telling them how upset he was that they had turned away from him and his word, and right after that, he would tell them how displeased he was that they had not been faithful in looking after the widows and orphans. I can go in every book of the Old Testament and point that out to you if I had time, but I don't. But you also need to remember that this was also Jesus's, or why Jesus rather condemned the religious leaders of his day in the New Testament. The problem that Jesus had with the Pharisees and the Sadducees was not just their religious hypocrisy, but also their refusal to allow the temple to function in the way that it was designed to function. You remember that after the triumphal entry, Jesus comes in, turns over the temple because they had turns over the tables in the temple because they had made it a den of thieves and robbers. It had become about money. And Jesus says, y'all are no longer helping the people that you have been called and commissioned to help. Okay? Maybe y'all think I'm making this up. Let's, let's look at a couple of scriptures, and, and I'll practically be done. Turn to, to Deuteronomy 24. I need you to see that God is a God of social justice. Deuteronomy 24, verses 17 through 21. Now, this is Moses, for the second time, giving God's law, Deuteronomy Literally means second giving of the law. Moses is giving the law to the new generation of Israelites who are preparing to go into the, to the promised land so that they won't mess up like their ancestors. He says, I, I, let me tell y'all what God said again so y'all can get it right. In verses 17 through 21 of Deuteronomy 24, hear what, what, what Moses says on behalf of God. You shall not deprive a resident alien, or an orphan of justice. You shall not take a widow's garment in pledge. Right, that, that has something to do with, 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 with within the legal system. I ain't got time to dig in it, but I, I, I just want you to get the gist of it. Remember, God says, that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you from there Therefore, I command you to do this. When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, don't go back and get it. You leave it there for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow so that the Lord your God may do what? Bless you in all your undertakings. When you beat your olive trees, don't go and be greedy and strip what's left. Leave it there for the alien, for the orphan, and for the widow. Verse 21, when you gather the grapes of your vineyard, do not glean what is left. Leave it there for the alien, for the orphan, and the widow. Remember, you were a slave in the land of Egypt, therefore I'm commanding you to do this. He says, I want you to always be thinking about those who are marginalized. Because if no one else is thinking about them, God's people should be thinking about them. Why? Because God's people should remember what God did for them. He says, remember, you were slaves in Egypt. You were once a marginalized people. You were once a forgotten people. You were once a, a people that were taken advantage of. And look at what I did for you. How I provided for you. How I was gracious towards you. Don't Forget what I've done for you. And as a consequence, that should help you to remember to be just, equitable, and fair towards others. Y'all don't like that one? Look at what he says through his prophet Isaiah. Look at what he says through Isaiah. 
Isaiah chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I've had enough of burnt offerings. He's talking about their worship here. I've had enough of your burnt offerings, of rams and the fat of fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who asks this from your hand? Trample my courts no more. God says, don't, don't, even show up to my, don't even show up to the church no more. Don't come to the temple no more. Bringing offerings is futile. Incense is an abomination to me. New moon and Sabbath and calling of convocation. I cannot endure solemn assemblies with iniquity. He says, you're not going to sit in my house with hearts full of sin. Not going to do it. Your new moons and your appointed festival, my, souls, my soul hates. They have become a burden to me. I am weary of bearing them. When you stretch out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. There you go lifting up your hands in worship, thinking God see you. I give myself. God says, I don't see you. <laughs> What else? Even though you make many prayers, I, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves. Make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. And do what? Learn to do good. Seek justice. How? Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan plead for the widow. He says, if you want to worship me in the right way, you got to start there. Start doing what I ask you to do in terms of your interactions with people. Dealing justly with people. Says it again through the prophet Amos. And I, 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 I know this is a lot of scripture, but one is Bible study. Two, I want to drive this home because you need to know tonight God is a God of social justice. Amos 2, verses 6 through 7, God says this through his prophet, talking about judgment on Israel. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals. They who trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and push the afflicted out of the way. Father and son go into the same girl so that my holy name is profane. That last verse, if it sounded like what you think it sounded like, that's exactly what it meant. And what God is talking about there is the unjust mistreatment of widows. That rather than taking care of them, people will ex or were exploiting them sexually. He says, I won't stand for it. You'll be judged for it. And then in chapter 5 of, of Amos, verses 21 through 24, God says again, I hate, I despise your festivals. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the offerings of well-being of your fatted animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the melody of your hearts. Verse 24, many of us know this because, because of, you know, it was mentioned in one of Dr. King's famous speeches. He says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Take care of the widows and the orphans. Let me give you one more just for the New Testament's sake, what Jesus says in Matthew 23. It's just two little verses. Matthew 23, verses 23 and 24. To the religious leaders, those who were representatives of God in the, in the society in the New Testament. Woe to you, cursed be you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you tithe, mint, dill, and cumin, and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy 
and faith. You doing all of these good spiritual, yeah, you tithe, but, but you ain't got no justice about you. No mercy, no compassion, no faith. It is these you ought have to, to have practice without neglecting the others. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat, but swallow a camel. What he's saying there, the stuff that's hard, you ain't got no problem doing. But the stuff that's easy, that's what you struggle with. Taking care of the widows and the orphans. God is a God of social justice. God is a God of those who are disinherited and dispossessed. And those who are the oppressed. And James says, getting back to the lesson, that if our spirituality, if our life of worship, is to be pure, if our religion is to be true, then guess what? We have to be people and believers who are concerned about those individuals as well. So what is this as it relates to Christianity and even Christian ministry? What, it mean? what does that mean? Social justice is not optional for Christian ministry. It's central to it. I say it again, you know, there, there are some out there some of our Southern Baptist brothers and sisters who think that social justice have no, has no place in Christianity, has no place in the Bible. What Bible are you reading? It's at the center of our faith. But finally, I'm done. I've held you long enough. We got to have some spiritual balance. We got to have some spiritual balance. And in pursuit of spiritual balance, however, we just can't be concerned with social justice but we must also pursue lives, according to James, of moral integrity and wholeness. What does James say? We got to care for the orphans and the widows in their distress, but we also got to keep ourselves unstained from the world. A God-honoring life is not just a life that denounces social sin, but it is also a life that confronts personal sin and makes sincere, wholehearted, full-throated efforts to live righteously. You have to try to live right. And I'm particularly talking to those in my generation and these, these new believers who really and sincerely believe that as long as you try to do what's right, you don't have to live right. See, we made those two things synonymous. I can be a good person or pursue good things, but I don't have to live righteously. I don't have to try to live right. No, 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 no. James says, you do what's right socially, but you also got to work on keeping yourself unstained. You got to try. You got to put in the effort. Ultimately, this verse is teaching us that doing good even in the name of Jesus will have a little impact, only a little, if there is no inward transformation for other people to see. People got to see something in, something in you has to be different. And you can minister, hear me, young folk, I, I, I love this generation that I'm a part of. You know, we're, 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 we're real militant, like some of our grandparents were in, 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 in generations past. Not scared to get out there and protest and do all of that. Wonderful. Great. I love it. But you need to hear me. You can minister through your marching. You can minister through your protesting and minister through your advocacy. But that ain't enough. You also need to minister through your meekness. Be a little more humble. Be a little more modest. You need to minister through your prayer and your praise life. That don't, don't treat church or worship, the, the community. I hope you understand now, even through this pandemic, that corporate worship is sacred. You don't take it for granted. And you need to make significant strides in your prayer and praise life. And you need to work on your attitude. What good is being a social, you are advocate for social justice, but you walk around with a bad attitude. How is that giving glory to God? No. 
you got to have some spiritual balance. You just can't have the social part, but you also got to have the spiritual part. And guess what? Both of them, in essence, are spiritual. I'll close with this. Many of you have heard me say it before. But you got to have right beliefs. A big theological word for that is Bible study. I can drop it on you. A big theological word for that is orthodoxy. If you've ever heard that word before, orthodox or orthodoxy, it simply means the right beliefs. Yeah, you got to have the right beliefs. What you believe about God, what you believe theologically, what you believe about the scriptures, what they teach, what they proclaim. You got to have the right beliefs. But your beliefs also must be balanced with the right practices. We call that orthopraxis. You got to believe right, but you got to do right. And when you do this, this leads to spiritual flourishing. You grow not just when you believe the right way, but also when you behave the right way. It's not either or. It's both and. You need to know the word, and you need to work on your walk. When you do that, that's when you grow. And it's a process. You plant a seed, whatever, flower, fruit, whatever. It ain't going to grow overnight. You nurture that. You nurture it. And over time, it grows and it produces. But each day you got to work on it. And the more you work on it, the more you grow. But it begins by responding appropriately. So I'm done. What are the three keys to spiritual flourishing again? That I must respond attentively to the word. I must respond actively to the word. But I also have to respond appropriately to the word. I got to be a doer, not just a hearer. I got to be slow to anger, slow to speak, and quick to listen. I got to care for the widow and the orphan, keep myself unstained from the world, because I don't want to have a deceptive or destructive spirituality. Hope that you were blessed by it. I say amen to it. Amen simply means that you agree with all that has been said, and I hope you say amen to it as well. For the man, woman, boy, or girl who's listening to me tonight, and perhaps as a consequence of what you have heard, you feel the need impressed upon your heart to commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, to unite in fellowship with his church. I want you to go to our church website, bellavistambc.org, or you can email our church administrator, Kubi Priester at kpriester at bellavistambc.org. And on that join us tab or in your email, let us know what are the reasons that you are coming to be a part of either our church or what commitment you are making to the Christian faith. And we promise to respond to you, to walk you and lead you and guide you in, in that decision. Furthermore, before we log off tonight, as I ask each and every Wednesday, every time we gather, we give, even in a virtual way. If you would be so kind and so gracious and so obedient as to give an offering tonight on any one of our giving platforms, on our website, which I just mentioned, bellavistambc.org, through our text giving, texting to give to the number 713-903-7611, or by mailing your gift in to 803 East 36th Street, Houston, Texas, 77022. I want you to do that, and it will certainly help us to continue to spread the gospel and the good news of Jesus Christ. Thank you for joining me tonight. Come here, baby girl. Come here. Come here. <laughs> My daughter is with me tonight, and I want her to wave at y'all, wave at the camera, wave at the camera, tell everybody good night. Good night. <laughs> good night, you guys. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you next week for Wednesdays, worship on Wednesdays. Go in peace, go in love, and go in joy. I may the very God of peace, love, and joy go with you now, always, and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.